Hi everyone. Today we start talking about health and medicine and actually that seems a little strange to say since it seems like we've been talking about health and medicine for a month and a half now. Um, but what an apt uh, subject for us to be looking at this week. So in sociology we look at health as again a socially constructed institution and there's a lot of criticism going on currently about how our institutions have been set up and we do a lot of comparison with other countries. Um, right now that is seen in how we do epidemiology. Um, as I show this picture of Dr. Fauci beside us, we have gotten used to seeing his face um, off and on and um, understanding the idea of the study of disease and the study of patterns of distribution of sickness, injury, death, social factors that shape them and how we deal with that in a society. Studies also uh, in epidemiology involve not only health and illness experiences, but we also take into account things like gender, age, race, social class, or behavior. As we've heard, for example, the black community has been especially uh, hard hit by COVID-19. And you're gonna see more articles about that because in sociology, we're the ones, uh, especially sociology of medicine, um, uh, experts will be writing a lot more about that over time. We have to recognize different rates. You're not expected to know the math behind this, but to understand um, how we look, at least scientifically, at medicine. For example, how uh, successfully a public is aware about diseases and associated illnesses and behaviors in their own health. Um, and one of the ways in which we manage success in the sociological um, world is people being more aware um, and also having more uh, access. One of the base rates that we continue to look at for the health of a country is fertility, which is interesting um, because um, population is something that um, often has shown health, but it also can cause a lot of problems and conflict perspectives will often say our overpopulation is one of the major reasons we're experiencing the epidemic the way we are. So fertility rate is something that uh, has in the past been seen as um, a indicator of health, but it can also be an indicator of women not having access to uh, controlling childbirth. And so um, there's a lot of different ways we look at that. But what the fertility rate tells us, it's the level of childbearing for an individual or population. And we find populations that have higher levels of education tend to lower their fertility rates. You'll look at the United States on this chart um, and then compare it to other countries um, where especially female education uh, has lower access. Also social factors like, you know, the value of how we determine um, our family makeup and role, what women are expected as far as their roles in society, ideal family size, and things like even religious history. We also study rates uh, based around mortality uh, as a whole. Of course, looking at infant mortality, whether a person exists past a certain time in life uh, often determines the health system, um, how much uh, a child has a chance or life chance of surviving. So infant mortality uh, tells us a lot about medical institutions uh, across the globe and we uh, measure that in rate of infant death per thousand live births. So as you look at the chart, you can see different places where our infant mortality um, plays uh, different uh, levels across the globe. One thing you need to recognize though too is that the United States isn't necessarily uh, the best with infant mortality rate. As we've also looked at COVID-19, and this is a map just uh, downloaded from the World Health Organization about morbidity. This is what we're studying right now, which is the study of how fast something spreads illnesses and diseases, the incident rate and the prevalence rate. And this was showing the rate uh, by country uh, in the United States. And you can see that we are in the darkest blue region compared to the rest of the globe. Um, there are other parts of the globe that are, have experienced that dark blue region, but ours is going to continue to get darker because we're going to have more cases show up. So let's look at the different roles of uh, theory and the lens that we look at. Uh, how our systems function or work or are viewed. The functionalist perspective of healthcare is 
to look at Talcart, Talcart Parsons, sorry, that's a one, hard one to say, uh, four-part um, observation of what we call the sick role, meaning uh, a legitimized illness and how society expects the sick individual to act and be treated. So if, for example, on an average day and every day, sickness or illness, um, you, you will be expected to monitor that yourself. For example, the flu. I'll get a message from a student that says, hey, I'm sick. I don't want to come to class because I'm not feeling well. I don't want to give it to people. That's a sick role that's totally expected. Um, there are then other ways in which the sick role has a monitoring that goes on with the authority of physicians, meaning um, let's say you start to not just feel sick, you start to have uh, things that you cannot self, uh, self um, uh, diagnose and you have no idea what's going on. That's when you go into the sick role and giving the authority to a physician to look at that. And again, the functions and dysfunctions of our health system uh, give access to different levels of physicians and uh, those who are specialized or different levels of um, treatment. So the functionalists will say that in society, a person's sick role will be played out in a way that uh, eventually, if you can't self-determine and take care of your own uh, sickness, that then you'll give over authority to help pay for somebody to take care of that sickness. And then, of course, we put healthcare into helping pay for that. Medicine shifted from general practitioner models to specialist models, which is one reason healthcare has gone up so much because uh, it's not just one general practitioner that you go to, like the family doctor. I even grew up in a time where we just had a family doctor, the same family doctor. Uh, that I had growing up was also the one that delivered me. Um, and we just don't see that as much. It also results in um, healthcare costs rising, leaving many without adequate coverage or access to specialty physicians. Functionalists also look at disease, sickness, and illness differently. And we have to see illnesses where, again, the person is the subject of their own symptoms. They're ill. Sickness is where we have determined societal definitions, social and cultural concepts of a condition. And a person then is placed in a category, for example, I've shared this before, I uh, suffer from depression, so I take uh, some medication for that. That's often not an illness as much as it can sometimes be seen as a sickness if it's not controlled. Um, and of course, there's a lot of times society will use that sickness term, um, and then sometimes it can even be moved into disease. Disease then is some sort of a pathological, biological defined, um, and often controlled by the practitioner's definitions. And of course, that's what we're seeing with COVID-19 is it's being uh, defined for us. It's not something that we've necessarily uh, had access to understanding. And so it's not an illness, it's not a sickness, it's a disease. The conflict perspective will say that the inequalities that we expect in society based on status, socioeconomic income, race, gender, all of the different um, isms that we encounter definitely affect our health. Um, the patterns of health and illness are not accidental. And we see, for example, higher rates of um, heart disease in, in certain communities or diabetes. Instead of defining healthcare as a right, our capitalist system uh, sees it as a commodity that some persons can have the ability to afford. And a lot of times people fall into what's called a healthcare gap where they can't uh, be covered by local. Um, or by government uh, care and also earn a high enough tax bracket that they uh, don't get the uh, tax benefits. So the medical system itself ensures that the power is maintained through those who are already in charge. Um, in 1910, Flexner report reported high, higher medical standards and we started to see the United States become a higher level of um, what we would call uh, uh, specialized health care and being able to treat disease at a larger uh, scale. But we started to see limited access to medical education and care um, because people did not take care of themselves via their families or even in their small communities. They started to rely on larger institutions for those definitions. 
So we see in our current situation then a large coverage gap in the United States um, and Medicaid is one of those areas that we'll hear uh, debated a lot of times. We've just heard of it recently in the state of Kansas as people are expanding it, but uh, there are lots of debates as to how much and, and how much we can afford. So these two char charts show um, by state uh, the different uh, distribution of adults who have one income above Medicaid eligibility and two lower limits for tax credits. So they're caught in that gap. Texas has the highest level caught in that gap, 26%, Florida 20%, Georgia 11%, North Carolina 8%, and all other states are 35%. Then you'll notice here that the South by 89% has put most of its population uh, of adults in that gap. And that's something we're gonna to have to be dealing with. Feminist perspective. Um, another thing is that a lot of times health and medicine has been defined through the lens of the male gaze and body. And uh, there, you can do a lot of history on um, comparisons of men to women and um, lots of uh, misinformation about um, our, our bodies and how we deal with them. Uh, the feminist perspective would say throughout history then, uh, women's health and illness was reflected as negative and there were conceptions even, um, there's a famous uh, article uh, or small, small uh, essay uh, written by Virginia Woolf uh, called the oh, it wasn't, I don't know if it's Virginia Woolf, but uh, it called the yellow wallpaper um, and or the yellow room and how a woman was uh, sent away to a health facility to recover from hysteria, basically, and uh, was sickened by the yellow wallpaper that she was forced to stare at the whole time. So um, the control of female bodies has been something uh, on the debate of uh, politicians and uh, actually religious and cultural organizations as well. And uh, the feminist perspective would say we need to trust the gaze of females in their bodies um, and give that trust to them. Also, since the 30s, women's natural physical conditions like childbirth, menopause, premenstrual syndrome have all been medicalized, meaning that uh, it is very difficult for a woman. They have to go out of their way to actually uh, participate in childbirth in ways that they feel more healthy and not um, in the sterile environment of a hospital. And we've talked about that previously in class. So uh, feminists would then say that we need to start uh, not just um, talking about female bodies, but talking about bodies in general and how we control them. It's not just about looking at male or female bodies. It's looking at the entire body and how people present themselves and that um, and, and being able to trust that, that people know. The interactionist perspective would say health, illness, medical responses are socially constructed and maintained. And so right now we're working um, through this theory a lot. We're seeing on Facebook, everybody uh, interact about COVID-19 and you can't get away from it, whether it be people interacting, um, saying that, you know, they're putting funny memes or people saying stay inside or another saying hashtag you need to go outside. I mean, there's just so many different ways we're interacting right now about this very event. And interactionists are gonna be studying this for a long time. How did society define um, the medical response? And also how did it shape us for the rest of time? Um, we are altering and we're gonna have actions. Maybe people will buy more masks and keep them readily or make them from home. Maybe people will uh, start to cook more at home. <laughs> um, we don't know what's gonna happen, but we know the interaction has changed how we define what we do every day. Maybe we'll just go back to the way it was. We don't know yet. Uh, also, we have to recognize interactionists um, often define their disease by socially constructed definitions and I, images, beliefs, and perceptions. And so this is another thing I think that's been interesting with uh, the rise of the internet in the last 20 years is how many people go online to figure out what's going on instead of, um, just waiting around, they start to put the things together that, that they can find. And because that's been constructed for them through the internet, um, WebMD has become a, a thing. And uh, a lot of people place a lot of belief in that. And um, so that's a, a really interesting um, development. Doctor's power also depends on cultural authority. You'll see different cultural authority of a doctor 
uh, in the United States and um, different regions. You, again, have seen how people are treating Dr. Fauci one way or another, um, you know, whether they believe the CDC. That often has a cultural, perspe cultural perspective to it, sometimes a political perspective, obviously, and the amount of superiority. One of the interesting things in uh, many parts of the world is a doctor isn't um, paid after a person's sick. Um, they're often paid to keep people healthy. Uh, where you have regional doctors and um, uh, actually pharmacies um, where people can go and get health um, remedies and then you don't pay to stay healthy. Uh, or you, you, you basically, if, if you're sick, the, the uh, doctor or the pharmacist isn't paid is what happens because they see themselves as failing. So it's kind of a flipped interaction there. And I think that's pretty interesting when we think about ways we look at the, the world. We have to look at the different groupings of um, how health is experienced um, by gender. Uh, and this tends to, again, focus on the heteronormative descriptions of this. But um, while women live longer than men, women do experience higher rates of non-fatal chronic conditions, um, things like heart disease, um, cancer, and um, we have to recognize that there is a tendency in female bodies to experience that. Men experience higher rate or rates, though, of fatal illness, such as dying more quickly than women when the illness occurs. These differences have been attributed to three factors, genetics, risk-taking, and health care. Um, the higher your education, uh, if you are part of more educated groups, the better your health. You usually, again, have more access to specialty or even health food. Um, it's expensive to eat healthy, and there are plenty of studies on food deserts, which you're going to hear uh, quite a bit in the ESU environment because uh, our um, own uh, Dr. Rodriguez Carey is working on uh, this uh, very subject with several students, and I, I know we're going to be hearing more about that in the department. Also, schooling more, may correlate strongly to good health and occupation and income. School lunches vary, and um, if, if you go to a private school, a lot of times you have uh, access to even better food. Educated individuals are more likely to also practice not only healthier lifestyle, but they visit their primary physicians more. They use new medical technologies or medicines. They're able to be participants in, for example, going to gyms or programs. Um, they're well aware of health consequences of smoking and drinking, and they also tend to transmit healthier lifestyles to their children. Again, a conflict theorist would say um, that is something that uh, is part of the whole social system that has broken down that not everybody has access to the ability to pull that off. The cost of the uh, United States healthcare spends, uh, we spend about 18% of our GDP on health. I wonder if that's gonna go up quite a bit, we'll see. Um, and the comparative analysis consistently shows that the United States underperforms relative to other countries in most dimensions of health performance and we spend more than any other country. We're lacking in both access and quality. So when you look at this chart, this is just a 2016 between 1970 to 2016 comparatively to other countries that have basically the, the same kind of um, economic breakdown and also tend to be core capitalist countries, our health care has risen uh, substantially more, um, where we're up to um, a larger, almost 18% of our GDP, you see places like the United Kingdom, where it's about 7% of their GDP and everyone has health coverage of some sort. Healthcare costs are rising because of one, increasing application of technology. Technology is expensive. The aging population of the United States. This is very important. The boomer generation is the largest cohort in the United States currently. They're also our oldest uh, aging population. They're the most at risk right now with COVID-19. And so um, we love that generation, but we also have to recognize uh, that the population uh, that is older is going to cost a nation more money. Overall demand for health care is greater. The amount of uncompensated care is also meaning that the healthcare industry is 
making up the lack of uh, payments by um, higher uh, taxation or distributing that onto other folks who can pay, the cost of prescription drugs and medical doctors facing rising costs. The uninsured population in the United States, and this is an older uh, figure, but it was sometimes um, our figures are based off of when the last um, major health uh, uh, report had been done. And there, there are others, but it said in 2013, 13.4% of the US population had no health insurance. We'll probably see some more rates come out um, alongside the uh, US census. We also have a larger census that goes out um, that is uh, the American uh, family um, or yeah, American family population. I can't remember exactly what it's called right now. I'm too tired. But um, it basically goes into the a three page uh, type of interview and we find out a little bit more about the population and coverage. The majority of uninsured people were employed and most of them were people of color. 20 million Americans have been covered under ACA provisions, including Medicaid in, in expansion. And we know that that's increased even more in the United, United States since these numbers. Medicaid expansions have been controversial, but they research, the research basically says it's a positive impact because uh, we do see people covered by Medicaid actually going to the doctor more and staying healthier and staying out of the health institutions such as hospitals. State health care reform is in great need. Sometimes um, we don't recognize we are not a federal system of health care, even though there are certain things that come down from the Fed, such, which we'll talk about um, the Obama reforms. But um, most of our work in the United States is uh, done through state uh, reform. So Hawaii, Florida, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Oregon, and Washington are committing to providing more health coverage for all of its citizens. And um, Hawaii is actually uh, covers quite a bit. Of course, the population's a lot lower too. Uh, it's an interesting state to study when it comes to health care because they tend to be healthier. Federal health care reform. In 2010, President Obama implemented the Affordable Care Act, which we have all called Obamacare since its implementation. Young adults up to age 26 remain covered by their parents' health insurance plans, and then there are plans available for people with pre-existing conditions and lifetime limits on coverage were limited so that people could have access to health care. And it's uh, the sense of people saying it's required is um, something that has gone back and forth, especially with the Trump administration. Lots of people taking um, part in things like co-ops, um, and trying to get around uh, being required to health, have that health care coverage in that particular um, setup that was set up in 2010. And again, we haven't been able to re-reform this, um, even though that was one of the first things we saw the Trump administration throw into the pot. Um, but um, at this point, this is, this is the health care uh, model that the U.S. is using. Um, the GOP 2018 tax bill included a provision to repeal the individual mandate um, to repeal and replace, but of course that did uh, fail. Children's health insurance programs ship uh, in 1997 enabled states to implement their own children's health insurance program for uninsured low income children and that still maintains. Um, due to increasing need, many states have expanded that program coverage um, because they're running out of federal funds and so they're needing um, to um, figure out ways in which they can make sure the younger population, because that's also one of our most expensive populations to um, take care of if uh, children are uh, finding med medical conditions show up early in their lives, then we have to take care of them longer, obviously. In 2009, President Obama signed the SHIP expansion bill, which then insured 11 million children. Another piece that we recognize is that state prescription drug plans have had to come into place because prescription drugs continue to um, be part of the debate uh, based a lot of times on insurance um, companies fighting over uh, the cost and how to distribute that onto people using the drugs. 5% of the world's population lives in the US. The US uses 50% of its prescription drugs. Many say we're addicted, I would agree. Um, there are certain things that we do need drugs for. I'm not saying that we don't, um, but at the same time, 
this tends to be something that um, you would think over time our prescription drug use would create a healthier environment of people and we see an opioid, opioid crisis and all kinds of things um, as far as addiction and also not necessarily dealing with healthier lifestyles or dealing with the actual increase of our health in the midst. I take a prescription drug for my uh, depression though and I think there's times where you have to recognize again how much of it is part of an illness that you're monitoring and having the ability to monitor um, and uh, so we, it's, it's a debate that we, we constantly have to bring to the table. States have tried plans including drug costs covered by lottery funds. Um, that's something in the state of Kansas that uh, I know that people have talked about, the creation of nonprofit non -consor consor uh, consortiums to purchase drugs in bulk at a discount and also buying drugs from Canada, the UK, New Zealand, and Australia. And I will say this, if you are ever in Texas, and you go across the border. Um, this is something my parents have done forever. Um, they go to the pharmacies across the border, get cheaper drugs and bring them across. And these are places that we actually get the drugs from anyway. Um, but it, it's, um, it's an interesting cultural aspect of the retired. The final thing I wanna bring up about healthcare and um, we can talk about um, the basis of the system, but you know, we have a lot of privatized hospitals and we didn't even get into privatization, but I don't want to make this too long of a lecture today. But the community based health centers are something that a lot of people aren't aware of. They're not always up to the best standards, but sometimes they are decent enough for us. Uh, in the 60s is when we started to see more com community based um, health centers and costs covered through contracts, grants, private insurance basically help people get the health care they need. Um, and uh, the, this is a nonprofit organization most of the time. 1,400 nonprofit centers across the U.S. They're located in every state, meaning you can find them in Emporia, Flint Hills Community Health Center is one of those. Located in every state, D.C., Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and Pacific Basin. 2016, 23 million people were served. And um, not all of them. This is one thing that's interesting is they can be partial um, community based and uh, connected to larger systems and we'll see uh, as capitalism continues to be something um, that privatizes healthcare. Um, we constantly see the, the uh, intersection of uh, our health um, centers and communities um, needing needing to not only be reformed, but also um, they can't survive. We, we're seeing just like food deserts, what we call medical deserts, um, where the local um, hospital goes out and a county hospital, for example, might be owned by a company or switched in a company. We just had this happen recently uh, in uh, Wellington where Overnight, they received word that the county hospital was closing down and happened to be the night before we started to have the lockdown in the state from COVID-19. And it was privately owned, but at the same time, it had been a community clinic. And um, so we see a lot of back and forth when it comes to trying to keep those centers alive. No doubt we have a lot of work to do on health reform. I'm interested in what we're going to be hearing um, about this week. Have a good week and um, stay healthy.